What's the word, y'all? Welcome back to the recap. Feels good to say those words, man. I do all explanations to how this went from a near daily thing to it not being that. And I'll say that for the end of the video because I know a lot of people here don't care, really. They just want to hear me talk about basketball. So let's get into it. Talking about that late night game, man. I speak for everybody that tuned into that game when I say, we need a seven-game series right here, right now. Phoenix Suns versus Utah Jazz, they match up so well together. A seven-game series needs to be on the horizon. Now, the bad news about it is, I know we still have a month and a half left of the season, but this is the one and the two seed. So if they're going to be matched up in a seven-game series, it has to be in the conference finals. And while the Nuggets, the Lakers, the Clippers, these are teams that uh, want to have a word <laughs> that might prevent the Utah Jazz and the Phoenix Suns from seeing each other in the conference finals. But they match up so well together. I need it. To see two top players under 25 go out one half 40, one half 34 in a win, it's just amazing. And, and one of the main questions I get is, Kenny, how did Chris Paul become your favorite player of all time? Well, today was a performance like that. Now, imagine him doing what he did today. Amplify that significantly. And imagine 11 and 12-year-old me watching him do the things that he does. Yes, that's how it happened. That's how it happened. Because when he was his, when his prime, you know what? We're not even going to go there. We're not even going to go there. But these are the performances that I absolutely love. Shout out to the Phoenix Suns for pulling this one out. One of my least favorite things about basketball, or NBA basketball specifically, is the way things end, right? For three and a half quarters, we have both teams running these free-flowing offenses, well, kind of. Um, we, we see in screen and rolls. The Chris Paul pick and roll with DeAndre Aiden was dominated. Rudy Gobert because he struggles regarding those things. And then we get to the fourth quarter. It's close it's three minutes left and everything we just did for the three and a half quarters don't matter because it, it reverts to give the ball to my best player and let him do his thing and that's just the way the NBA basketball goes but it just feels we if I'm if I'm a coach and again I, I know way less about basketball than Monty Williams so I'm not I'm not telling him how to do his job especially since he did get the win I would have continued to go to Chris Paul in that pick and roll. I mean, it worked out, again, because they got the win. But it just reverts to these things. And this is something that me and De'Aaron Fox talked about on a recent interview of how that's just the way NBA basketball is. And I asked him, how? Why? And he didn't really have a real answer. It's just it's how we play it. You know, it's just, it's just how we play it. Because at the end of the day, I guess you trust Devin Booker taking a shot over Jay Crowder, even though Jay Crowder was great. You trust Donovan Mitchell taking a shot, especially today, over anybody else on the team because they were really struggling from beyond, uh, behind the arc. So I just understand that's how it is. But it does kill the game a little bit. Them fouling up by three does kill the game a little bit. But I understand why you do it. Because at the end of the day, you don't care about what the fans at home, their viewing experience. If you're Monty Williams, you care about getting the win. So fouling Donovan Mitchell... When you're up by three, for him to hit two free throws, when you have one of the clutchest players at the free throw line in the history of basketball on your team, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but a game like this, and this feels this feels harsh to say, or it feels terrible to say because the Utah Jazz have been so dominant this entire season. But a performance like tonight is one of the reasons that, that many fans, I'm not speaking specifically for myself, but many fans find it hard to really trust them as like really the guys. Right, when you when you talk about the number one seeds, historically you're like, this is the team that is the best in the league. I'm pretty confident this team is going to go on and win the conference and go on to the finals. And I know majority, and I, I, I'm being honest with, with y'all, majority of NBA fans out there don't believe that the Utah Jazz is that team. Especially when you think about, well, the Lakers will be healthy again one day. I, like, I even asked my friends who, who we co-hosted a podcast to, because I'm always interested in these type of things too. I asked them, if you, who do you trust more, the Utah Jazz or the Denver Nuggets in a seven-game series? They win Denver. Who do you trust, Utah Jazz versus the Phoenix Suns in a seven-game series? They win Phoenix. I think a lot of people are, are I, I must, not mistaken, but don't really trust the Utah Jazz. And today is one of those performances. Why? Because if you have, have a game where you can't hit a three, which they really struggled with, it reverts to Donovan, please hit some shots. This is, this is the only thing we have right now. And it's very James Harden, Houston Rockets is from a few years ago where they go 0 for 27 and three-point shots where it's like, okay, nobody else can hit their shots, so we really just need our star player to create offense for us. And it just lacked the, the movement that maybe some of the other sets from other teams have. And I think that's what people really believe. Like when it comes down to a seven-game series, do we trust that the Utah Jazz is going to be a 45% shooting three-point team for not just one series, not just two series, not just three series, but a whole four series to go on to win a championship? That's just I think that's what the main concern is for the Utah Jazz. We know that the defense is real. 
We know that Donovan Mitchell's good. We know that Rudy Gobert's defensively is good. We know that Mike Conley can do some things, but do we trust the, all of the outside things recently? No, even though they've, they're, they what, 8-2 and two in their last 10, they've been very, very good. Their six-man of the year candidate, Jordan Clarkson, hasn't been good in the last 10. Doesn't really matter too much. Um, but those are just the things. The Phoenix Suns look really, really good, and, and I just wish that we can get a seven-game series of that. And I'm not counting out of the realm of possibility, but it is, it would be, it would be very, very tough for them. Some of the other games we had were the Knicks going against the Celtics. This was one I was heavily invested in because, y'all, I hate to break the news to y'all. Every As long as y'all have known me, whether it be on this channel, any of my other channels, I've always been an objective basketball fan. I just always have been. And the reason for that is my team has been trash for as long as I can really remember. And this is a year where we're trying not to be that. <laughs> so when I see two of the teams that we are competing with playoff spots for, the Celtics and the Knicks, go against each other, I got to tune in. You know what I'm saying? Because I, one of these teams is going to lose, which means that it opens up the door a little bit for my Chicago Bulls. And, like, this is this sucks to say because uh, Toronto Raptor fans have been through a lot this last season. But, honestly, I'm actively rooting against the Toronto Raptors to steal my team's spot. And, I, I like, a, a lot of y'all are used to me being an objective fan. But now that the Bulls are involved to potentially be one of the 10 teams, because, again, now it's 10 teams this year, I can't watch the team surrounding them and, and root for them anymore. So we saw the Knicks versus the Celtics go against each other, and the Knicks continue to do this thing where they they uh, win through three quarters <laughs> and then just blow a lead. I think their last five losses have been games they went into the fourth quarter leading. The last five. The fourth quarter offense is disgusting. And, and, and it's not like the Boston Celtics were much better this game, but they were better. Better enough to win. A lot of it was, was um, of course, Jalen um, Jalen Brown had big-time games. But off the bench, you had Tristan Thompson all over the place. I don't know what the box score really says. It says he had uh, 7.8 rebounds. I promise you it felt like he had way more than that um, in this game. And his impact was, was felt. And a game like this. Well, when I was watching this game um, late in the fourth quarter, it's the same thing we just talked about. It revert to give the ball to my best player and let him do something, and their best player is Julius Randle. In a game where Julius Randle wasn't necessarily great, and, and, and his secondary player, which is R.J. Barrett, was on fire, we don't get the, get the offensive plays ran through R.J. Barrett. We just don't. And I know he's upset being snubbed off that 25 on the 25 list. Let me break some news to y'all for y'all that don't know. Um, those big publications that put together these lists, again, I work with one of them. I'm literally wearing a Bleach Report hoodie right now. Um, part of it um, is bait, right? So people are really upset that R.J. Barrett wasn't on this list. And part of the bait is we're going to hold out or we're going to snub somebody on a big market team or we're going to put somebody from a big market team lower than where they should be or a beloved player like Devin Booker that was lower on the list because we want people to talk about it. So, but like, like, like Devin Booker is beloved by everybody. So in order for us to get a little buzz on the article, we're going we gonna to drop him on that ranking just a little bit. Those are the things that go through the minds of the people in those offices. I'm just breaking the news if you didn't know. Um, so, yeah, that was a fun game to watch. Another fun game to watch was the Brooklyn Nets beating up on the Pelicans. Again, this is a game I ha have any stake in, but I did want to see Zion continue his streak, but it did not. He only ended with 16 points. Uh, Kevin Durant came off the bench and be just was Kevin Durant to a higher extent, did not miss a single shot in 18 minutes. Um, and and my boy, my boy, who is a, um, a Detroit Piston fan, he has tweeted at me a few times saying, is it okay that I'm upset with, with Blake Griffin um, at the way it ended in Detroit. And my answer to him, yeah, it's okay. You're a Detroit Piston fan, right? And you, you, you're you a team that invested a lot of money on this player, a lot a lot of time with this player for him to go out the way it is. It is okay for you to be upset. But I, I would say to you, Detroit Piston fan that is upset with Blake Griffin, doesn't he personally just look happier? You know what I'm saying? If he stayed in Detroit, he probably wasn't going to be happy with the remaining years of his contract. So, yes, he forced his way out of there by being bad for an entire season. But, look, we got good Blake Griffin again. And that's all I, that's all I really care about. I just want everybody to be happy and play to their fullest potential. Um, one of the reasons why we have taken a step back when it comes to the call game recaps is because I haven't been able to watch as much basketball as I really wanted to. And a lot of that is because of some things going on behind the scenes where we're transitioning this this recap will come back to full strength eventually um but I, but i've been working on this called game venture for since october um and we are so close to launching where it would be me play in players and people in the nba industry interviewing them talking to them just doing overall fun things and and we kind of underestimated 
the impact of the coronavirus when it comes to booking talent and things like that. Um, and, and I've been working very hard behind the scenes to try to get this thing a reality because at the end of the day, though I do work with BR slash House of Highlights, I've always been an individual and, and this called game venture is allowing me to do what I really envision for myself for the future. Um, so I actually have a trip back to L.A. on Monday. I'll be going from Monday to Friday doing more shoots. And then after I recap those shoots, we'll officially, officially be launching Called Game on this channel. It is a monumental moment for me personally because we've been working so hard on this. It's all independent. And I appreciate if you guys show some love. Uh, I'm going to spoil it. I think the first episode is with Metal World Peace. We recorded that like a month or two ago, which is crazy. And um, We got some other great NBA players or people in the realm of basketball booked up. And I just, I just hope that y'all enjoy it, man. I hope that y'all enjoy it. The first couple episodes are a bit weird because I, I am trying to find myself with other talent. You know what I'm saying? So bear with me as we try to turn uh, nothing into something. That's really what it was. It was me with a budget. I was building the set. Me hiring a production company. Me getting talent into the building. And overall, me interviewing and trying to be different than some of the other things you see on d different publications like BR slash ESPN because I'm trying to be independent here. So those are the reasons why the key recap has, has died out a little bit. Because, again, there were a lot of games today, and I only got to talk about two of them because those are the only two games I had time to really watch today. So my apologies for that. And hopefully in two weeks when we launch Called Game, um, y'all will show some love on it, and then this recap can continue to grow on side of it. All right? I appreciate y'all. I'll see y'all soon. Peace. Call Game.